Hey guys, I'm Abby Johnson. Now you may or may not be a fan of the 80s TV series, The A-Team. Some of you might not have even been alive for that, like me. <laughs> but you probably know the famous catchphrase from the show, I love it when a plan comes together. This phrase was used throughout the show by the cigar chomping leader, Hannibal. And now if I'm being honest, I've actually only seen the modern day remake starring Bradley Cooper, but nonetheless, I too love it when a plan comes together. And that's exactly what happened for me when I really dug into our reading from John chapter 12 today. We're gonna see a little bit more of God's plan for worship unfold. And here in John 12, we see this beautiful picture of Mary pouring out costly perfume on Jesus' feet, worshiping him in such an extravagant and lavish way. And we're going to get to Mary in just a minute, but what I want you to keep in mind is this. Judas wanted to sell this perfume valued at almost a year's wages under the guise of providing for the poor. But verse 6 tells us that Judas didn't want to help anybody. He just wanted to help himself to the money bags. The message of this text is that Judas's intent was to steal what rightly belonged to God. Mary's extravagant worship of Jesus was offensive to Judas, and Judas coveted that opulence for himself. Now this got me thinking, this isn't the first time we've experienced this sort of scene playing out in scripture. Something so similar can actually be traced all the way back to the very beginning with Cain and Abel in Genesis chapter 4. And verse 3 reads, In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Now you may know the rest of the story, but Cain ends up murdering his brother Abel out of jealousy because God was pleased with Abel's worship, the very best fatty portion of meat from the first of his flock. And while Cain did bring a sacrifice and worship, he withheld the very best portions for himself. What's crazy is there's actually more similar stories in nature. When you flip over to 1 Samuel chapter 2, you read a really peculiar story that begins in verse 12, and it says, Eli, the priest's sons, were scoundrels. They had no regard for the Lord. Now, it was the practice of the priests that whenever any of the people offered a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come in with a three-pronged fork in his hand and while the meat was being boiled and would plunge the fork into the pan or kettle. Whatever the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is how they treated all the Israelites who came to Shiloh. But even before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come to the person who was sacrificing and say, give the priest some meat to roast. He won't accept any boiled meat from you, but only raw. If the person said to him, let the fat be burned first and then take whatever you want, the servant would answer, no, hand it over now, and if you don't, I will take it by force. This sin of the young men was very great in the Lord's sight, for they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt. Okay, I know that's a lot. That's a really crazy story. And I don't really understand all of this passage at first, as there's a lot of Old Testament law at play here. But no matter, the priests were stealing something that again rightfully belonged to God. They were stealing the raw portions instead of taking what actually belonged to them. Do we see a pattern forming here? All throughout scripture, people skimmed some of God's glory some of his adoration, some of his rightful possession off the top for themselves. And what happened to them in the end? Well, Cain became known as an aimless wanderer. Hophni and Phinehas, these guys who were supposed to be leading the way in worship, they were both killed in the same day in a hopeless battle, and the whole house of Eli was actually cut off as ministers before God. And Judas ends up betraying Jesus over the very same thing he wanted in this John 12 passage, money. Not the kind of end that neither you or I want. But what's so interesting about this first Samuel passage is that this whole ritual of fat belonging to God was commanded in Leviticus 3.16, telling us that all fat belongs to the Lord. 
Now, I don't know the entirety of fat's significance, but when I think about it in the natural, we know that a fatty steak is usually a flavorful one, one that's juicy and fragrant, and that's how I imagine the fat portions belonging to the Lord. And after more in-depth study, I found that this command in Leviticus 3.16, the command that these two men failed to obey that day, was actually established because of Abel's pure offering, his wholeheartedness to God in Genesis 4. As I meditate on that, I wonder, did God create this command in Leviticus? And did he choose to record this story of Hophni and Phinehas all to point back to Abel's heart of worship as a testimony to you and I for the kind of worship that he desires? Remember, as far as we know, Between the fall of humanity in Genesis chapter 3 and the story of Cain and Abel in Genesis chapter 4, God didn't instruct his people for the kind of worship he was looking for. What Abel gave that day was his best. In his heart, he wanted God to receive the very best. And that brings us right back to Mary, our New Testament example of loving Jesus, no matter the cost, no matter the onlookers murmuring. You see, much worship of God will always be met with disdain when others are only worshiping in part. And as I apply this text to my own life, I'm met with the Holy Spirit's conviction. Because as much as I desire to see myself becoming more like Mary or Abel, I also see strands of Judas, Cain, and these two brothers woven into the fabric of my heart at times. Some of the common ways we can do this is by simply judging the authenticity of those worshiping around us, criticizing others' style of worship when it differs from our own, when all that really matters is a heart longing for Jesus to be adored. I know that I'm in need of God's fresh mercy today. I want to worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, like I said earlier, I love it when a plan comes together. Seeing God's plan for the kind of worship he seeks ignites my heart to go deeper with him today. I hope it does for you too. See you guys soon.